Hi guys, today I want to talk to you about the possible meaning behind one of the Beatles' most hotly debated tracks, And Your Bird Can Sing, from Revolver. This track, written mostly by John Lennon, sounds like it was written about a specific person. However, Lennon never did reveal who that person actually was. So today we're going to examine a few fan theories and I'm going to give you mine, with a lot of contextual information that I believe makes it probably the right answer. So let's start with fan theory number one. And Your Bird Can Sing was written about Cynthia Lennon. In her book A Twist of Lennon, Cynthia wrote that she believed this song was written about a gift that she gave to John. She says, I bought a clockwork bird in a gilded cage which I wrapped up carefully, just leaving the winding mechanism at the base exposed. Before handing it to John, I wound it up. The imitation bird warbled loud and clear from its perch as John unwrapped the strange looking gift with an expression of sheer disbelief on his face. Beatles author Kenneth Womack also accepts Cynthia's version of events, saying this. For Lennon, the bird in the gilded cage offered increasing testimony about their ineffectual marriage, as well as regarding what he perceived to be her utter failure to understand him. As Lennon sings in the last line, you don't get me. Personally, I'm not entirely convinced by that interpretation, however. And that's because there are so many lines in the song that when you try to apply them to Cynthia Lennon, they kind of come across a little bit tenuous. So let's take a look at the lyrics to the first three verses and see what they say. Verse one says, you tell me that you've got everything you want and your bird can sing, but you don't get me. Did Cynthia have everything she wanted? I don't think so. By all accounts, their marriage was pretty unhappy at this time in the few years before it collapsed. I don't know that she was particularly smug or self-satisfied or anything like that. It's just my opinion, but right from the first line, I don't get the impression that this song is about her. Let's look at the next verse. You say you've seen seven wonders and your bird is green, but you can't see me. Again, we get this impression of someone kind of bragging, someone claiming to have been everywhere and seen everything and done everything. Was that Cynthia Lennon? Did she really claim at that young age to have already seen the seven wonders of the world? Not that I'm aware of. You tell me that you've heard every sound there is and your bird can swing, but you can't hear me. By this point, the whole Cynthia Lennon thing is starting to fall apart a bit for me because would Cynthia Lennon have claimed to a beetle that she had heard every sound there is? Would she have claimed to be a master of all the music in the world? While there is a link that she herself drew between her gift of a birdcage and this song, the picture John seems to be painting here in his lyrics, I genuinely think depicts someone else. It's a caricature of arrogance, of swagger, of self-satisfied smugness. And while I am far from the master of all Beatles knowledge, Cynthia did not seem that kind of person to me at least. If you think it is about her, however, please let me know why in the comments below. And now let's move on to the second major fan theory. And Your Bird Can Sing is actually about Mick Jagger and Marianne Faithful. The Beatles Bible says, while Lennon never revealed the inspiration behind the song, it is believed to refer to the rivalry between the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. Although the two groups were friends, Lennon saw the Stones as Beatle copyists and the titular bird may have been Marianne Faithful. And just a quick side note here for international viewers who might not know, bird is British slang for girl. It seems that this fan theory was actually started by Marianne Faithful herself. According to Beatles author Steve Turner, she actually claimed publicly that this song was written about her and Jagger. The first chorus says, when your prized possessions start to weigh you down, look in my direction, I'll be round. And the second chorus says, when your bird is broken, will it bring you down? You may be awoken, I'll be round. Now this could be considered a criticism of Mick Jagger and kind of calling him materialistic, 
But to be honest, I'm not going to do any explanation of these lines in that context. And that's because one simple historical fact blows this theory out of the water right from the word go. Here's the full detail from the Steve Turner book. Marianne Faithful has speculated that the person being addressed was Jagger and that she was the bird who could sing. But she must be mistaken because at the time the song was written, she wasn't Jagger's partner. Apparently, Marianne Faithful and Mick Jagger didn't even become a couple until the end of 1966, and this song was being recorded in April. Jagger and Faithful were apparently with other people at that time. There is of course the possibility that Mick Jagger and Marianne Faithful were together secretly for like the whole of 1966 and Lennon knew about it, but we have to go with the sources we have. I'm not aware of any evidence for that, so I think we have to say that this song could not have been about Faithful and Jagger. And so that brings us on to the third major fan theory and the one that I personally think is correct. That this song was written to and about Frank Sinatra. But to explain why I find this interpretation so compelling, I need to give you guys a bit of context to the relationship that had been brewing between the four working class lads from Liverpool and the mafia connected crooner. The Beatles grew up admiring Frank Sinatra, who was one of the world's major acts, particularly in the 1940s, 50s and early 60s. However, Sinatra famously hated rock and roll, saying this in 1957. Rock and roll smells phony and false. It is sung, played and written, for the most part, by cretinous goons and by means of its almost imbecilic reiteration and sly, lewd, in plain fact, dirty lyrics. It manages to be the martial music of every sideburned delinquent on the face of the earth. It is the most brutal, ugly, desperate, vicious form of expression it has been my misfortune to hear. It's probably not surprising then that when the Beatles landed in New York in February 1964, Sinatra did not hold a very high opinion of them or their chances. He had previously been the king of New York and was not expecting to be dethroned any time soon. Beatlemania, however, swept in like a tidal wave. A column that George Harrison wrote for the Daily Express about their first visit to America was actually footnoted by a Frank Sinatra quote in 1964. I thought the Beatles would die in New York, it read. I was very surprised by the reception they got. I guess I was wrong. And of course, regarding how the Beatles took off in America, most people do know the story from here on in. The Beatles took hold in the States and were absolutely massive. They became the next big thing. And some of the American old guard did not like it, Elvis and Sinatra included. The lack of support from their heroes does seem to have bothered them, but John Lennon in particular. According to Rolling Stone, Lennon claimed publicly in the press that the band were bigger than Elvis, bigger than Frank Sinatra, and of course, famously, bigger than Jesus. He would also make what could have been seen as little digs at Frank Sinatra in the press from time to time. Here's one example. When asked by Chicago DJ Jerry Bishop whether the Beatles would ever record with Elvis, Lennon replied, None of us have ever liked those albums where they put two people together who are either similar or, I don't know, like Sinatra and somebody else, you know. I don't like that. I'd hate an album like that. So the Beatles initially landed in America in 1964, and come 1965, Frank Sinatra had not cooled towards them at all. According to Sinatra biographer and former aide George Jacobs, the 60s as we would know them hadn't yet happened in 1965. The Beatles were just emerging from England and big change was in the air. But Mr S thought the mop tops were a stupid fad like hula hoops and Davy Crockett coonskin caps. They weren't quite as bad as Elvis. At least they're white, he joked. He didn't give them long. The Grammy Awards in America had started to recognise the Beatles as well, awarding them best performance by a vocal group in 1964 for A Hard Day's Night and Best New Artist that same year. However, the next year, in 1965, Frank Sinatra beat them to the award for Album of the Year, winning with September of My Years and leaving the album Help as a runner-up. He also beat them in the category of Best Male Vocal Performance. It was a very good year, 
triumphing over yesterday. And so 1965 and particularly 66 represented the time when the rivalry between Frank Sinatra and the Beatles was at its most intense. Sinatra's dismissive attitude towards them began being reported more frequently in the press, particularly in one very famous article in Esquire magazine called Frank Sinatra Has a Cold. And here's a passage from that article where he takes a direct swipe at the Beatles. Within an hour or so, NBC was scheduled to begin taping a one-hour show that would be televised in colour on the night of November the 24th and would highlight as much as it could in the limited time the 25-year career of Frank Sinatra as a public entertainer. Sinatra had been very excited about this show. He saw here an opportunity to appeal not only to those nostalgic, but also to communicate his talent to some rock and rollers. In a sense, he was battling the Beatles. The press releases being prepared stressed this, reading, if you happen to be tired of kid singers wearing mops of hair thick enough to hide a crate of melons, it should be refreshing to consider the entertainment value of a video special titled Sinatra, A Man and His Music. So there's a bit of context. Now let's go back to the song. When we looked at the Mick Jagger, Marianne Faithful timelines, they didn't line up. However, when we look at the timing of the release of this article, and the recording of the first demos of this song, everything lines up perfectly. It seems likely to me that after years of back and forth pot shots in the press, after losing to him twice at the Grammys, and then being mocked by him in a major article in a global publication, John Lennon had had enough. The article, Frank Sinatra Has a Cold, was written about Frank's life in the winter of 1965, but it was actually published in the April 1966 edition, presumably on the first of that month. And Your Bird Can Sing was first recorded in late April 1966, the same month, within weeks of the publication of the article. So John had time to read the article, digest it, and write a song as a response. But the uncanny timing is not the only connection between that article and the song. Understood in this light, Lennon's song seems to be based around constant wordplay on the word bird. Now let's take a look at a few passages from that article to find out why that might have been. Standing in the corridor of the NBC building, Sinatra was discussing a recent CBS show about his life with several of his friends. Two of them laughed about Sinatra's apparently having got the word bird onto the show, this being a favourite Sinatra word. He often inquires of his cronies, how's your bird? And when he nearly drowned in Hawaii, he later explained, I just got a little water on my bird. Under a large photograph of him holding a whiskey bottle, a photo that hangs in the home of an actor friend, the inscription reads, drink Dickie, it's good for your bird. In the song, come fly with me, Sinatra sometimes alters the lyrics. Just say the words and we'll take our birds down to Acapulco Bay. Men follow him, imitate him, fight to be near him. There is something of the locker room, the barracks about him. Bird, bird. So he apparently liked the word bird and used it a lot. Later on in the article, we find out what he meant by the word bird. This is taken from behind the scenes while Frank was filming for the movie Assault on a Queen. Frank Sinatra was on the beach in the next situation, supposedly gazing up at the stars, and Verna Lisi was to approach him toss one of her shoes near him to announce her presence, and then sit near him and prepare for a passionate session. Just before beginning, Miss Lisi made a practice toss of her shoe towards the prone figure of Sinatra sprawled on the beach. As she tossed her shoe, Sinatra called out, hit me in my bird and I'm going home. Verna Lisi, who understands little English and certainly none of Sinatra's special vocabulary, looked confused, but everybody behind the camera laughed. She threw the shoe towards him, it twirled in the air and landed on his stomach. Well, that's about three inches too high, he announced. She again was puzzled by the laughter behind the camera. So, in short, in Sinatra's world, bird was slang for knob. According to the article, he used the word constantly in that context and was always asking his inner circle how their bird was. 
This clearly amused Lennon no end, as he seemingly based the whole song on it, constantly changing the meaning of the word bird between its traditional meaning, the British slang meaning, and Sinatra's old-school American meaning. And that wasn't the only way Lennon incorporated the theme of mocking Sinatra's bird. On Anthology 2, you can hear an outtake of an earlier version of the song, which they recorded in a different style to the final version. This early attempt is arranged in a style that directly copies the tone of American band The Birds. He took the concept of Sinatra's bird and applied it in every way conceivably possible. And at the end of the version of this take which is included on the Deluxe Revolver album, you can hear Lennon and McCartney whistling and twittering like birds right at the end as well. They even included birdsong. And all the way through this early version, you can hear John Lennon and McCartney absolutely pissing themselves laughing. They giggle like idiots from start to finish. Clearly, something was very funny. I would like to suggest that this is it. They are singing a song ridiculing Frank Sinatra and constantly referencing his bird. Go listen to the version of And Your Bird Can Sing on Anthology 2 if you haven't yet. It's brilliant. So, now let's look at the lyrics of the song in light of this article and see if it all makes sense. Here are the three opening lines to the three verses. Each one talking about the monumental arrogant claims of the recipient. You tell me that you've got everything you want. You say you've seen seven wonders. You tell me that you've heard every sound there is. Now compare those comments to this passage singing Sinatra's praises from the article. He seemed now to be the embodiment of the fully emancipated male, perhaps the only one in America, the man who can do anything he wants, anything, can do it because he has the money, the energy and no apparent guilt. In an age where the very young seem to be taking over, protesting and picketing and demanding change, Frank Sinatra survives as a natural phenomenon, one of the few pre-war products to withstand the test of time. He is the champ who made the big comeback, the man who had everything, lost it, then got it back, letting nothing stand in his way, doing what few men can do. So next up, in each verse, we have Lennon's references to Sinatra's bird. Let's look at these first through the lens of the British slang, bird meaning girl. Right after the passage we just examined, the article continues in its somewhat overblown praise, saying, Frank Sinatra did what few men can do. He uprooted his life, left his family, broke with everything that was familiar, learning in the process that one way to hold a woman is not to hold her. Now he has the affection of Nancy and Ava and Mia, the fine female produce of three generations, and still has the adoration of his children, the freedom of a bachelor, he does not feel old, he makes old men feel young, makes them think that if Frank Sinatra can do it, it can be done. Not that they could do it, but it is still nice for other men to know, at 50, that it can be done. So here are the three references in the verses that Lennon made to Sinatra's bird. Your bird can sing, your bird is green, and your bird can swing. So this is a bit of hilarious wordplay on Lennon's part, and probably part of why Paul and him were pissing themselves laughing when they tried to sing it. Sinatra was at this time dating Mia Farrow, almost 30 years his junior. She could sing, as evidenced by her work in the film Rosemary's Baby. She was green, meaning young and inexperienced, and she could swing. She was part of the swinging 60s. So, the bird in the verse lyrics seems to be Sinatra's girl at the time, Mia Farrow. Or at least, that is one fairly convincing interpretation of these lyrics. But, as is so often the case with Lennon, there are also hidden meanings to the lines. Reread those lines reinterpreted through Sinatra's American definition of the word bird, meaning his wedding tackle, and they become pretty damn funny. And your bird can swing, that's quite a funny line. And then each verse ends with what could be seen as a response from Lennon to Sinatra, each of which is very self-explanatory. You don't get me, you don't see me, you don't hear me. At that time, Sinatra didn't appreciate who the Beatles were, what they represented, or the brilliance of their music. But it could also be interpreted in a slightly more aggressive light. 
Rather than saying, you're misunderstanding me, it could be Lennon saying, you're surrounded by all these cronies, but I'm not going to be part of your collection of fans. You don't get me. I have no interest in meeting you, so you don't get to see me. And I've no desire to perform for you or with you. You don't get to hear me. And now we come on to the two choruses. And if I'm on the right tracks here, if this really is what Lennon was writing about, these are some of the funniest lines in the song. When your prized possessions start to weigh you down, look in my direction, I'll be round. Now on this line, on the anthology version, the outtake, you can hear Lennon cracking up laughing. I wonder why. You remember earlier I read you a quote from Sinatra's press release mocking the Beatles' hair. His press officer put the release out that he probably approved, calling them kid singers wearing mops of hair thick enough to hide a crate of melons. In an incredibly bizarre irony, the article also says this about Frank's hair situation. He also wore, as everybody seemed to know, a remarkably convincing black hairpiece, one of 60 that he owns, most of them under the care of an inconspicuous little grey-haired lady who, holding his hair in a tiny satchel, follows him around whenever he performs. She earns $400 a week. So, I think this line about Sinatra being weighed down by his prized possessions is a direct retaliation to him mocking their hair. It's Lennon pointing out the amusing hypocrisy of someone ridiculing the Beatles' haircut when he himself has a ridiculous collection of hair pieces and a woman who literally follows him around with them in a bag. I think the wigs are his prized possessions and Lennon is painting a kind of image of Sinatra being weighed down under a pile of all 60 of them, literally buried under a mountain of wigs. It's Lennon saying that when the time comes and you're too old and you're weighed down by the amount of silly paraphernalia you need to maintain your image, when it's over for you, I will still be around. Brilliant bit of sarcastic Lennon lyric writing. There is only one other stanza in the song and that's the final chorus, which continues in a very similar vein. The last set of chorus lyrics say, when your bird is broken, will it bring you down? You may be awoken, I'll be round. And so here we have the most obvious reference to Sinatra's bird. Lennon switches from the British meaning, which would be, will she bring you down, to the American meaning, will it bring you down? I think it's another dig at his age. When your bird is broken, will it bring you down? When your equipment stops functioning, will that be the end of you? You might wake up one morning and realise your time is all over. And when that time comes, Lennon seems to be saying, I will still be around. So we've come to the end of the lyrics. It's a really short song, just two minutes long. And that is my interpretation of what these lyrics mean. But what happened next? That wasn't the end of the story as far as Sinatra and the Beatles were concerned. Because after the article was released, but before Revolver was out, the Beatles found themselves locked in a chart battle with none other than Frank Sinatra. They released Paperback Writer and he released Strangers in the Night, and the two acts found themselves head to head in a battle for the number one spot in the UK and in America. In the UK, Sinatra hit number one first, and then the Beatles dethroned him the following week. In the States, the Beatles hit number one on June the 25th. Frank displaced them the next week on July the 2nd, and then they displaced him again right after on July the 9th. The Frank Sinatra versus the Beatles rivalry also continued that year at the Grammys, where Sinatra beat the Beatles for Album of the Year in 1966, with the September of My Years winning over Help, he beat them again next year in 1967 when A Man and His Music beat Revolver to the top spot. But in the end, the Beatles came out on top in 1968 when Sgt Peppers won the award and Frank's latest offering fell into second place. Come 1967, Frank Sinatra was still bitterly resentful about the way culture was changing. Former aide George Jacobs says, Sinatra's 1967 film, The Naked Runner, turned out to be a major debacle because Mr S hated London, where the film was set, for being taken over by the Beatles and the Stones, and he hated the swinging Carnaby Street mod atmosphere so much that he basically dumped the picture, went back to LA, 
and let the producers worry about putting together whatever footage they had. It had to be one of his worst films. And so, before we move into 1968, where Frank Sinatra and the Beatles found a kind of uneasy peace and moved into slightly calmer waters, I want to share a rumoured exchange between Lennon and Sinatra that I've not been able to find proper sources for. Lennon is quoted as saying of Frank, I guess he's okay if you like that old guy stuff. Maybe he should have stuck to being a plumber or something. And Sinatra is rumoured to have replied, that limey punk. Little creep can't see two feet in front of him, so he wears his grandmother's glasses. If I ever run into him, I'm going to slap the smartass out of him in front of his Jap wife. Absolutely charming. That exchange has been reported and reproduced in multiple places, but I searched and searched and searched and couldn't find the original source. If it really happened, its origins have been pretty effectively scrubbed from the internet. After spending hours searching through websites and articles, I then turned to books, but after I got through 15 books, I just gave up. So, if you have a primary source for these quotes, please let me know in the comments below. I would be fascinated to know if that exchange really happened, but if no one has a source, those comments might not be true, they might just be apocryphal. Thankfully, by 1968, some of the hostilities were beginning to thaw, at least between Sinatra and two of the Beatles. In 1968, Frank Sinatra met up with George Harrison and they apparently got along well. According to the papers, Beatle George Harrison admitted he was quite overawed when he sat at a record happening in Hollywood, a Frank Sinatra recording session. Harrison and the chairman of the board went to dinner to Stefanino's, the singer's favourite Hollywood hangout, and they chatted until the early hours of the morning. Around this time as well, Ringo also extended the olive branch to Sinatra. In his photo collection Lifted, Ringo mentions commissioning a recording called The Lady is a Champ, which was a slightly changed version of The Lady is a Tramp. He asked Frank Sinatra to record this as a birthday present for his then wife Maureen, and Sinatra agreed to do it. In the book he says, Maureen loved the music of Frank Sinatra, so for her birthday in 1968, I asked Frank Sinatra himself to record a special version of a song for her. Old Blue Eyes singing The Lady is a Tramp for my first wife with great new lyrics. It's called Maureen is a Champ and Frank sounds great. And that song is available to listen to on YouTube. As far as I'm aware, things never properly thawed, however, between Paul, John and Sinatra. Paul apparently wrote a song called Suicide and sent it to him, hoping he would record it. But to me, the song does sound like a really obvious piss take. Apparently, Sinatra thought so too and rejected it. Paul plays it very coy and innocent in interviews about the song, but if you look at the lyrics, it really does seem to be an obvious wind-up. And Paul's demo of this song is also available on YouTube if you would like to do some further digging. Sinatra would go on to cover two Beatles songs. One was the song he beat at the Grammys, the Beatles classic Yesterday, but the one he really loved was written by George Harrison, the song Something from Abbey Road. He would introduce the song Something as the greatest love song of the last 50 years and the best song ever written by Lennon and McCartney. That is until someone apparently pointed out to him that they didn't write it. It was a Harrison composition. And apparently from 1978, he started crediting George live. In Anthology, Harrison confessed, when I wrote it, in my mind I heard Ray Charles singing it, and he did do it some years later. At the time, I wasn't particularly thrilled that Frank Sinatra did something. I'm more thrilled now than I was then. So, why didn't John Lennon ever come out and openly say who, and your bird can sing, was written about? In future years, he was actually really disparaging of the song, describing it as a horror and a throwaway song. In the years after writing his song How Do You Sleep, which was slamming Paul McCartney, he seemed to have some regrets about having expressed so much anger and said that perhaps the song was actually more about him than about Paul. And I wonder if, in the same way, just as time kind of cooled things for Sinatra, the same happened for John. I wonder if, as the years passed, he came to regret being quite so scathing. Sadly, we will never know, and unless Paul McCartney himself decides to open up and tell the general public why he and John were laughing so much on that early Beatles outtake, we may never really know for sure 
the true meaning behind this brilliant and mysterious Beatles classic.